a minute late. Started to make you all panic, didn't I? Hey everybody, it's Mike Myers. Woo! Welcome to the Monday, Wednesday at 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time. Although I'm pretty sure that's the last time I'm going to be saying Central Daylight Time. I believe we are uh, going backwards starting uh, this weekend. I think so. Uh, if it's not this weekend, it's next week. But anyway, uh, welcome aboard. The goal of this live stream, or as I like to call it, Ask Mike Anything, stealing from Reddit, there 100%, um, is to give those of us who are isolated by the coronavirus an opportunity to be able to work together to continue our studies of CompTIA certification. Um, so that's the main goal here. Uh, it works kind of like this. Number one, you ask me questions and then I answer them for you. So the best way to ask questions is right here in the chat window. Go ahead and ask me questions there. Uh, I'm monitoring that as well as my buddy Scott Jernigan and Dave Rush and a cast of thousands. Uh, wow. Okay. And uh, so it works out actually pretty uh, easily that way. So. Um, Go ahead and just ask your questions. If your question is complicated or long, don't worry about that. All you have to do is send me an email. So just send an email to michaelm at totalsend.com and you can be contacting me and putting together your question any way that you want and uh, we'll be sure to answer that for you. So if anybody was looking for last Monday's show, I deleted it because it stunk and I didn't like it. And anyway, it boiled down to I was unable to get my Windows 10 system to join the domain that we had spent the previous two and a half episodes putting together. And I fixed it very, very quickly as soon as, of course, as we signed off and I got a little adult beverage in me to mellow me out a little bit. So uh, that'll be fixed. We're going to talk about that shortly. I've um, got a few more few email questions I want to address. And uh, just double checking some e in, uh, incoming email here. I got about four, three or four emails I want to hit on today. Uh, also, I need to warn you is I am going to be giving a commencement speech today. Unfortunately, it's going to be a little after three o'clock my time, which means we only get an hour together today. I'm very, very sorry, but uh, I'm very interested and very happy to be giving a commencement speech even though it's remote uh, and uh, so we're gonna have to I'm gonna have to take off a little early but don't worry stick around because the guys are literally I'm gonna sign off and the screen will go a little for a moment and then the guys are, will appear so uh, I'll warn you when this happens at 3 o'clock but uh, so we're gonna have a little bit of a hopefully just a few seconds of break but we'll see how that times out so uh, you only get me till 3 and then the guys are going to kick over and uh, they'll finish the second hour for me. Thank you guys very, very much. Uh, so I'm doing a commencement speech for a wonderful uh, tech school called Perscolis. And uh, they have locations certainly in New York, certainly in Florida, someplace else. I'm going to get in trouble. I should know this stuff off the top of my head. Uh, they've been uh, customers of ours for a long time. And I'm thrilled to give these guys a send off. So it should be fun. All right, so who's all on today? Well, I'll tell you who is not on today is my co-pilot Jack has blown me off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to speak to his agent. Uh, he's usually waits till about four minutes before showtime, and he plops down in his chair, and we're jackless. That almost sounds rude, but anyway, eh, we'll see if his royal highness decides to appear at some point. You never know with Jack. He is a persnickety thing, to say the least. Uh, gosh, where do we go? Ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, here, we, elbow, 10 minutes early. Did you guys, uh oh, am I working? Am I working right now? Mm. 
Well, it, what's actually kind of strange, guys, is that you say I'm working, but my app looks like it's frozen up. So we're just going to assume everything's okay. If, if I freeze up or something, start throwing in lots of text, guys, because literally right now my YouTube studio says I'm frozen. But I can see all your all's texting, so we're going to go with it. All right, let's go ahead and get started first off. Uh, when I show you what I did wrong last week, uh, when you're configuring a domain in Windows, as we've said many times, when you set up a domain controller, you make darn good and sure that that controller has a static IP address. And I could have sworn, in fact, I almost want to rewatch the videos where I carefully typed in a static IP address. Well, it just disappeared, and my server went back to a DHCP. And it was spewing out some bizarre thing. Remember, we had set up, uh, it set itself up as a DHCP client, okay? Yeah, we set up a DHCP server, set itself up as a DHCP client. Things got very, very confused. It got an IP address different than the one I had carefully typed in. And all I did is I went back into the server and I typed in the proper static IP address. I did 10.0.2.5. And guess what, folks? Everything instantly worked. Now, the problem is I can't show it to you over again, but I did take a couple of pictures. So all I did, I'm assuming you guys can see this. So I typed in labdomain.local, and then I typed in when it popped up. It asked for a username and password for somebody who has the authority to allow the computer to join the domain. And I typed in administrator with his password, and that's the magic answer I got right there. I'm still terrified you guys are not seeing this stuff. Yeah, seriously, mine has completely, fr my YouTube studio has frozen up completely. So I'm just, uh, until somebody texts in something in there, I'm just going to keep going. Anyway, so uh, that might be a little hard to see, so I, I blew it up. And that was the sign that I wanted to see. And the moment I saw that, well, now I knew that that client was a part of the domain. The only thing I did wrong is for some reason the domain controller's IP address, the same IP address you guys set your, you know, where you set it all, went back to DHCP. <laughs> it shouldn't have done that. I, you know, I hit a cancel when I should have hit OK. You know, you always want to look at super complexities in these problems, but that's all it was. So yes, one of my big fears on Monday was that unactivated copies of Windows 10 would not be allowed to join a domain they are allowed to join a domain. I was also worried that unactivated copies of Windows Server wouldn't allow computers to join a domain. And clearly everything worked just fine. Yeah. My server went back to a DHCP client. I just went and typed in the static IP address. Boom, it worked like a champ. <laughs> Good lesson, yeah. In the doctor's world, they always say, if you see hoof prints, think horses, not zebras. And uh, I should have done the same thing and double checked uh, that one little thing and we would have been fine. Yeah, yeah what are you going to do? Good lesson for me. All right. Uh, <clears throat> should we do questions? I'll tell you what, let's, let's, uh, let me run through the questions real quick because I did see some early on. And, and, um, Elbow at 1.53 p.m. Did you guys know laptop chargers don't work when you plug them into the Ethernet port? Yes. Yes, I did know that. <laughs> oh, yeah, and folks, do remember that uh, today's special, which is 50% off, is make sure Scott Jernigan's got that up for me because you know he does. Uh, okay, so uh, today, this week's special is going to be 50% off all of our A plus and net plus uh, total testers uh, plus the Sims bundle. So you can get just the practice questions or you can get the performance based questions, which we keep separate. No, we're not trying to come up with clever more money from you. It's just it, the development is like a million times easier that way. <clears throat> and you can get the bundles, which is both the practice questions and the simulations or just the security plus total test or practice questions uh, for 50% off. So all you got to do is go to www.totalsem.com and get all your stuff. And just before you check out, 
uh, use checkout code 1026 2020. Dial 1 800 999 If you get that reference, I'll be proud of you. Um, but uh, type that in, you get 50% off. Folks, we're already about the cheapest of what I would consider the good practice questions out there. And, uh, and it's 50% off on top of that. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous, I tell you. All right. Uh, everything's just barely hanging on here. Uh, I'm almost afraid. I want to show you what my screen looks like. Seriously, Scott, Dave, everybody, if I suddenly disappear, let me know, all right? All right, what else we got going here? Paul Skinner. Oh, thank you and Mike for helping with my productive month. I got my Network Plus in the second, and you passed your Sec Plus yesterday. Congratulations, Paul Skinner. Well done, sir. That's back in 202. Hey, listen, Paul, you know what the next thing I'm going to say is, right? Go get a job. Get working, man. You got enough certs. People will hire you. Just go. Elbow, the red and black theme is ever growing. That is the bag for my gym bay right there. I've had it on the floor, but now the cleaning ladies came in. Oh, guys, the reason I was one minute late today, I sit down, everything's firing up, and I suddenly realize that the cleaning ladies had basically knocked my camera in a panic trying to relatively center myself in there. I think I'm halfway close. I thought I saw a lot of questions. Andre's here. Alice is here. Alice is here early. <laughs> All right. Paul Skinner, I'm actively looking to work, but Cloud Plus. Okay. Man, this thing's working. I'm not even going to look. I am not going to look. Everything's fine. You guys will tell me if things are not fine. Okay. Um, Laura Bryson. Hey, Laura. How's it going? I didn't even see you there. Yeah, you guys already had my speech ready. Get a job. Them all. Thanks, Mike. I'm facing the same issue. Can't, I can't able to connect domain and virtual machine. I'm waiting. Them all. Windows is pretty robust. And if any time you guys can't get a connection, look for obvious stuff. So I was able to ping the client uh, on Monday, but I wasn't able to click ping the server. And I was worried that might be a firewall issue. And the answer was, I just went back to basics. If you can't ping each other, you've got trouble. And I was assumptive. I was like, eh, everything's fine. Them all, if you can't ping somebody, that means that either they're physically not connected, either they don't have a TCP IP stack, or their network settings are not the same. I mean, that's all it is. I can diagnose almost any network problem there is with ping and IP config. Probably 90 plus percent of all network problems in my life can be solved with just those two tools. And I didn't even take my own advice. I think I even said it while we were talking. I was like, be sure to be able to ping both ways. Uh, I didn't. And uh, then I paid by having a botched uh, lab. So them all, number one, make sure each computer can ping each other. Start with that. Mm, Brendan S. Hey, Mike, why would you use DNAT or static NAT instead of PAT? What situations call for it? Not too many, honestly. Uh, there are a few situations where you'll see, like, you'll have a server and, uh, or, or let's say you have five or six Windows boxes. These could be virtualized. These could be in a cloud. They could be real boxes. It doesn't make any difference. And you just want to mask off their actual IP address, but you don't want to have a lot of goobity got going on. So what you'll do is you'll set up what's called static NAT, where one router will serve, say, four different IP addresses, but each IP address is statically mapped to one of the other ones. I can't think of anything else. Pat pretty much rules the roost these days. Christopher Shop. I just start, just passed my A plus, started a job search. Has anybody interviewed lately? Yes, Christopher, people are interviewing all the time around here. 
Are they pretty much all done through the video now? Uh, these days, the over the last few months, almost all the hiring I've seen has been done through Zoom meetings and stuff like that. So uh, COVID is keeping us apart. Oh, 206 p.m. Dakota Oni, IT noob here. Hi, IT noob. About to start learning at a training school nearby. Good for you. My question is, what should I be most excited for? If you could relearn, would you be? If you could relearn, what would you be pumped for? <laughs> I will handle this question professionally. Um, what should I be most excited for? Well, the fact that you're learning something new is, is always a good thing for me. Uh, Dakota, I don't know what training school you're going to, so that might be a challenge for me to be able to answer that for you. But, um, I mean, the greatest joy of being in IT is learning new stuff. I mean, for me, that's what it's all about, right? So uh, that would be the big thing for me. If you could relearn, what would you be pumped for? I've had so many Eureka moments in IT that I, I couldn't pick up one that uh, would do it for me. It's probably something small and easy uh, that you, most other people wouldn't think much about. Uh, the first time I got a DNS server to run on uh, a Linux box was a pretty happy day. Uh, the first time I successfully generated certificates and uh, threw them into a web server, it actually got legit uh, HTTPS working. First time I saw Windows 10. I mean, you know, there's just a bazillion things like that. Just being out there and learning and hanging out with other nerds who are learning Dakota, that would be a big thing for me. Jack, where the hell are you? Kitty! He really is holding out. He usually comes running. Uh, da, 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 2.06 p.m. Chris Arkwright. Hey, Mike, how do you set up remote assistance for a Windows environment? Windows remote assistance. Hang on. I'm going to have to dig this one up. There is a setting. It used to be in control panel. You guys are out. Half of you guys are going to beat me to it. Uh, control panel. No. Oh, almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Almost there. I think I'm almost there. Wow, another change in Windows 10. Uh, hang on, I'm going to show you what I'm doing here in just a minute. Anybody got to correct me real quick? So what I'm looking for is the old control panel setting that was for where you would give permission. Shoot. I can't find it quickly. Uh, Scott or Dave, can you help me out? Windows 10, the, uh, the settings where you can either request help or get a uh, remote desktop turned on. I'm going to see if Scott or Dave can pull it up for you quick. Uh, it's not where it used to be. <laughs> Story of my life there. I'm going to look one more place before I completely blow you off. Yeah. Let's see what the guys can come up for me because I'm just too slow to be able to do it without... We've got so many questions here today.
trying to get back to where I left off questions. Do you have a course on how to create a domain? <laughs> yeah, Junior, welcome aboard. Uh, uh, your name looks, hey, Margo? The other cat's showing up. Yay, Margo. Margo, come here, come on up. Come on up and say hi to the people. Yeah, she's not coming up. Uh, yeah, uh, the uh, Junior, we, uh, we had uh, uh, like the last uh, three shows, we were setting up domain and we also set up step-by-step -step instructions and everything's pretty good. Remote assist. Thank you, Scott. So uh, I typed in remote, or Scott Jernigan told me to type in remote assistance, and I got uh, this. Hang on, let me bring this up so you guys can see it. Uh, I don't, and it's grayed out, so I don't know where in the control panel this came from, but uh, this is the important one. So you invite someone you trust to help you, and you help someone who's invited you. That's usually the most painless way to set up uh, remote connectivity. It's not the only way. Uh, you can certainly just uh, go in, make sure that your account has the ability to connect remotely, and then the, uh, you just, it's remote connection? So then you just run remote desktop connection, and you'll get this screen. Let me bring this over so you guys can see this. Let me bring this over so you guys can see this. There we go. And this is the remote de desktop connection tool. And as long as the other machine accepts incoming remote connections, you can just type in its fully qualified domain name or its IP address, whatever you want, and you will connect that easy. Also, you got to keep in mind that with Windows, it's really whoever is logging in, do they have permission to do that? So when you're configuring users, either local users or domain users, one of the settings for those users is allow remote connection. And in that case, uh, anybody who has that, who's allowed to do it and have a legitimate username and password, either on the local computer or in the domain, can get in. And it'll pop up at a screen. And it looks a lot like a virtual machine, actually. Uh, but you have full control on that machine. <laughs> Keyboard to user interface error, or what we used to call uh, PEBCAC. PEBCAC. Problem exists between keyboard and chair. Mm. The IT crowd, Christopher Schock, good, good job. NM, hey Mike, why do you think barefoot wine is the beverage of the gods? Ah, uh, y'all. Cretans. For those of you who don't know, Barefoot wine is swill. <laughs> I'm reading your guys' IT got the crowd. I'll just put this over here with the rest of the fire. That was a very funny episode, William. Junior Chavez, yes, I have zero certs and been doing IT for years, working on certs now. Junior, if you if you're skilled, I mean you've been working in IT for a while. You, know, you really ought to probably consider A plus, Net plus, Security plus as your starter certifications. I don't know what you've been doing in IT, uh, but a lot of people who are highly skilled can usually do real well there. And to be honest with you, if you feel that you have pretty good skills, most of the time all you need are practice banks, just practice questions. And of course, we're selling ours for 50% off, but da da da. Uh, you know, if somebody's a total noob, then yeah, I'm like, get a book, get a video you know, go to a school, whatever. But if you're skilled, a lot of times just practice questions and uh, getting on the internet and double checking some things is about all you need. Shante McLeod, what tips do you have regarding, regarding a PBX? You mean like P 
PBX voice telephone system? Rip it out and get a decent VoIP system for one bazillionth the price? All right, so there, a few, God, that was almost 50 minutes ago. I need to get caught up here. Mm -hmm, 2.13. So Vimal's like, I did a firewall off both of them, uh, ping working, but still not connecting. Okay, Vimal, uh, again, I don't want to sit here and diagnose individual problems. If you want to send me an email, I'll work with you on an individualized basis. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I can't just sit here and in this time for everybody, just work you and I. But it, it is important that we get this fixed. So uh, they can ping each other is very, very important. Can you go back to the server, them all, go back over to the server, fire up um, Active Directory Users and Computers. When you fire that up, on the left-hand side, there's a folder called Domain Controllers. If you open that folder, does the server show up in there? That's the next thing I'd want you to check. NM, can you have two virtual machines talk to each other on two different compute? Talk to each other on two different computers in the same LAN. Two virtual machines talk to each other on two different computers. Well, the virtual machines are different computers, right? I mean, they're they're virtual, but they, you know, they have their own IP address and all that. So I think the answer is yes. Not quite sure what you're... Uh... <laughs> sure, Vinamal, you're always welcome to send me screen snaps. It's going to take a... I got to warn you, if you're just going to sit here and wait for me to try to answer this, I will help. But I'm slow. Uh, you might find yourself moving a lot faster. Just, you know, do what I do. If I see an error that I don't recognize, I type the error in on, as a search term. I have Microsoft Server set up on my laptop. Do you have a virtualized? Co do you, do you, you're right. What you, see, here's the problem, NM. You have to be much more detailed. I have a laptop. This laptop is running Windows 10. On this laptop, I'm running VirtualBox 6.1. One of my virtual machines in VirtualBox is. I mean, seriously, it, NM, if you want my help, I need that level of detail. Andre at Scott, no, we are not. No, Andre, don't ask Scott Jernigan, ask me. Monday's video is dead, Psh, gone. There wasn't anything that critical in it. I'm up to 218. Web Dev Bootcamp showed up. Just looking for questions, guys. Just bear with me. Shante McLeod, anyone here from SA San Antonio? I've sure walked the river walk in San Antonio a few times. 2.20 p.m. Crompolis Dumplings back. 2.21. Hi, Mike. All is good. I am not up to date with your video, so I'm going to go back and start watching. Feel free. Crompolis Dumpling. Isn't that in system properties? Uh, for remote desktop? Let me look. I don't quickly see, whoa, wait a minute, there's no desktop. Ha <laughs> ha, Compolis gets a shiny, shiny here. There you go. That's what I was looking for earlier. So this is under settings, uh, system settings, and I have to scroll down, which of course are going to show up easily here, but we can try. And down here is remote desktop, and enable remote desktop, just turn that on. Oh, please don't make my computer explode. 
What are the advanced settings? Yeah, use network level authentication. Stone connections. We just ignore all that stuff. And you could just get a the remote desktop client, this guy, and you can connect. Keep in mind the security is still pretty good because uh, I have to turn on allow remote connections, and even as I turn that on, they still have to log in with a local user account. So it's still pretty secure. No elbow. Margo is not a new cat. She's an old cat. She, in fact, she's 18 years old. Oh, now you're going to show up. Too late. I'm trading you in. Did Mar Margo actually show up on the... On the camera? Guess she did. Kevin Lopez, so are we going to redo last stream? No, because really the only thing we were going to do in the last stream was we were going to go ahead and make the connection and then we were going to do some PowerShell stuff. So uh, I guess we should talk about PowerShell. PowerShell is going through yet another big transition. And everything that I've covered so far will certainly be more than enough to get you through the CompTIA exams, you know, understanding commandlets, understanding the ISE, uh, starting PowerShell, understanding some of the basic commands. We've gone through that. Uh, but the part of PowerShell that I'm feeling like I'm leaving you guys hanging on is good practical scripts to get good practical things done. What's happening right now is the repositories that I've been using for over 10 years are being shut down and everything's moving to this thing called GitHub and I am not skilled at GitHub. So I was thinking to myself, I could run uh, a couple of examples to cover my rear end for what my promises were or I could take a good hard look at the reality of what's going on these days and do some R&D and then get back to you guys when I'm ready in terms of showing people how we use repositories and cool stuff like that. So I'm going to go with the latter. So basically, I'm going to be bailing on PowerShell for you know, a few courses until I get my own act together on it. And uh, we'll, be, we'll come back because what I really want to do is make sure you guys have good examples of PowerShell scripts that get real work done. And we're not, we, that's literally the only thing we haven't done. So I'm going to hang tight and we're going to I do, we'll get into this thing called GitHub. I don't know when. Soon. In October. Ooh, that's a lie. Or early November. <laughs> um. Two twenty four PM. Elbow. Mike, what is your favorite least part of the PC building process? Favorite part is the planning and the buying and visualizing what the system's gonna look at. The crappy part, uh, uh, cable management. I, I'm terrible at it. I just don't have that cable management button like so many other people do. I know cases today are a lot easier for cable management than they used to be, but still, uh, I make a mess of it. You give me RGB, I'm gonna give you a disaster inside your case. So I don't like to do cable management. So you like PebCAC Elbow? Hey Elbow, do me a favor, grab a pen and paper real quick. And I want you to talk about, there's another error that we talk about all the time called a ID10T, ID10T. Just write it down on a piece of paper. And we got an ID10T error. Oh shoot, Dave Rush said it right there, 225, 10 minutes ago. Dennis B 
Belazorov. That's a good Irish name there. Hi, Mike. I right now studying your course on LinkedIn. Excellent. Excellent. It's amazing. Thank you very much. I am not English speaking, but your English good and your video really interesting. Thanks. Hey, you're very welcome. Very welcome. Uh, 2 30 p.m. Surya DVP when I touch my right side of my laptop then screen gets hung up and shuts down what's the problem might be you've got a short and if it's if you're like touching the right side of your screen and getting a short that's ugly uh, that's really ugly most of you know first of all Taking apart a laptop is a big endeavor, and it's not something you should take lightly. Uh, it's not that laptops are particularly complicated, it's just that their screws are weird and things like that. So uh, getting a short like what you're describing, a lot of times this is literally the example where you take it apart and put it back together. You're probably tightening something down that got loose. Uh, shorts are rarely obvious. And without like an oscilloscope or a voltmeter at the very least to try to trace stuff out, it, it can be mind-numbingly complicated. Uh, but you've got a short somewhere in there. Usually if you can touch it, if you only touch it in one certain place and you get the short, then you can usually look around there. But if you can literally touch like anywhere on the right side, and when you say touch, are you meaning schwack or are you meaning deep? You know, that would make a big difference. But Surya, you've got a short and literally the, one of the most complicated, if not downright impossible things to trace out. Oh, Saudi Arabia. I didn't think about that for SA. So Laura, kitties are walking back and forth. Sorry guys. All right, there we go. Back to questions. You guys are all chatty to each other. What about me? What am I to you? Nothing, nothing. Almost want to do a separate channel where you guys are asking me questions versus y'all chatting among each other because I'm scrolling through oh, your little chitty chatties, which is fine. I have no problem with that. I just I'm worried I'm missing questions. Let's see if Scott Jernigan's yelling at me. South Africa. Harun Chadra, how is, uh, this is 2.35 p.m., how is a hardware firewall different from an OS firewall? Okay. Uh, actually, sometimes there's not a lot of difference. Uh, generally, when we say the word hardware firewall, uh, what we're talking about is a firewall that's going to be at your uh, internet service provider point, almost always your gateway router, especially for small and home offices. Uh, they put the, the firewall there because it's a convenient choke point where it can monitor any and all traffic coming into the network mainly, but also to a lesser degree going out on the network. Now, technically, there's no such thing as a hardware firewall. You have a router that has firewall software put on it. It's almost like saying, do I have a hardware word processor? I guess you could, but no, no, it's, it's software. But that is a term that's used. I've used it myself, and I'm going to stick with that. So usually when we say hardware firewall, we're talking about the firewall at your gateway. That firewall's main job, whether it's stateful or stateless, is to watch for evil coming from the Internet into your network. That's its main job. 
Uh, so if you look at like a stateful firewall on most uh, Soho routers, you basically just turn them on. You know, they might have an option like say, allow ICMP traffic or, um, you know, VLAN, uh, enter VLAN routing, uh, no, <laughs> not that, uh, VPN pass-through, virtual v VPN pass-through, stuff like that. But there's, because you, with a stateful firewall, you're just counting on the smarts of the software to deal with it. A stateless firewall, that's where we say, I'm blocking this port, uh, or I'm not letting these computers on the network from nine to five, or whatever it might be. So that's usually what we're talking about when we say a hardware firewall. A software firewall, and the better term to use, honestly, would be a network firewall versus a host firewall. And uh, so a host firewall, like the one that's built into Windows, really his main job is to protect your idiocy from hurting anything on the network. It doesn't allow you to run a program that's going to start phoning home without it bleeping something up and warning you. Uh, uh, so they really have two different jobs, and it is normal and good and right to run both firewalls. They, they are, they, they're really doing different jobs. One's blocking the evil of the internet from coming in to get you, and the other one's blocking you clicking on the wrong thing and suddenly somebody wants to start phoning home that you don't want. The Zerk 678, thoughts on RTX, uh, this is 2.30, 6 p.m. Thoughts on RTX 3090? Well, I don't know. Seems like the jury's kind of out on them right now. I think we had a little talk on that on Monday on the Discord channel. Uh, we were, for those of you who don't know, uh, our buddy Juan throws a uh, Discord channel. Uh, Scott Jernigan can throw that up if you want to, Scott, what, the link to that. It is not anything that is officially have to do with total seminars, although we do tend to pop in. Uh, it is private. It is uh, not nearly as uh, politically correct, uh, but uh, it's more of a, it's almost more like a happy hour kind of a thing, which you guys are all welcome to join. Web Dev Bootcamp at Total Seminars. Buy cheapest possible parts and upgrade later or save money for a decent build. You know, we always talk about these super high end graphics cards and stuff like this. Um, unless you're actually doing heavy gaming, you probably, or, or the, yeah, let me hang on, heavy gaming or graphics development. Like you've got Adobe Creative Cloud Suite or something like that. Uh, you could use a good graphics card, but most everybody else, they, the built-in Intel graphics or AMD graphics, assuming that you have the uh, APU and not the CPU, are fine, really. They'll play YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. So the, the, the challenge I have here is that buying something cheap today is probably okay. You know, keep in mind, I mean, if you buy something today, it's going to almost certain, any type of desktop or uh, theater system or whatever it might be, they're all going to have DDR4, right? Um, they're all going to have, uh, you know, seventh generation or later Intel or AMD processors. Um, they're all going to have mice and keyboards. Buy a 4K monitor. That'd be the only thing that I would tell you. Get a 4K monitor because that will last you a long time. And the other problem is, is once you go to 4K, going back to 1080 is harder than you think. But also, WebW, I would never buy the cheapest possible. Uh, when I'm buying computer parts, I'm going to stick to well-known names uh, I'm going to stick with vendors that I know and like. Uh, here in Houston, we have a vendor called Micro Center, who's absolutely fantastic. Uh, 
Some of the vendors like Tiger Direct, I get nervous about. I'm not saying I haven't bought stuff from, from oh, Jose, not Juan. Sorry, Jose Braden. Thank you for correcting me, Scott. Uh, I just get nervous about buying from some of these vendors. I mean, so buy, get a vendor, make sure you have somebody. And really, this is the big thing when I'm buying parts. It's a uh, reputable vendor, inexpensive shipping, and more importantly, no big restock charges if I have to return something, which can be a big deal. I'm not against a restock charge. You know, so you yank a CPU out of an OEM box, you know, they, it's going to cost them. Uh, but, uh, you know, 5% restocking, I wouldn't even blink. 20%, they don't get my business. 236, Janelle W. Any advice for a first timer starting out in IT and going to study for CompTIA Plus? Well, number one, hang out in here. This is a good place for that type of information. A little rat cat. Um, know that uh, because you're a newbie, relish in your newbiedom, be happy with that. Uh, ask lots of questions. Um, take advantage of the resources that you've purchased and get on it and get serious about it. That's the biggest thing. The biggest thing I hate when people say I'm, I'm studying for CompTIA A plus or CCNA or whatever is that they don't discipline themselves. You know, if you're going to do this, do it. You're spending money, you know, and so you want to set a time frame at some point in the future. And what I tell people to do is go ahead and pay for your test. I mean, I guarantee you, give yourself three months, four months, whatever it is. And uh, I don't think oh, you should be able to learn almost any certification in three or four months, in my opinion, assuming you can put 10 hours a week into it. Uh, but paying for practice test, uh, I'm sorry, paying for the real test really puts a lot of pressure on you, when I think good pressure, to uh, study. Because let's face it, especially in these COVID times, you know, you can sit here and study or watch uh, ep you know, reruns of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, right? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of the uh, It's Always Study kind of type, so. You know, setting yourself, disciplining yourself and setting yourself practical goals. Those would be the big things, you know. Uh, 2.37 p.m., Jason Grant. Mike, if a person has the CISSP, do you recommend getting the CASP plus? No. Jesus, Jason, somebody's got the CIS. To me, CISSP is one of those darn near terminal certifications. Uh, CSSP is not an easy uh, certification to achieve, and uh, it is pretty well respected in the industry. It's a management certification, security management, not so much getting into gators. Like CASP is very technical. So uh, if somebody was in a management position and found themselves thrust into a scenario where they needed to be, have more technical skills, sure, CASP is not a bad, well, not a bad one at all. CYS, CYSA, CSA, whatever it's called now. Might be a better route, but uh, it's very different. We got 10 more minutes, guys. <laughs> Uh, the true doctor, the hardware firewall, could it stop like MITM or DDoS attacks? Uh, you know, man in the middle is a style of attack. It is not a specific attack. I can do man in the middles in a wireless network. I can do man in the middles on web pages. I can do man in the middles uh, on a number of different applications. Uh, but a good firewall would stop a lot of the attack surfaces that allow many different man-in-the-middle attacks to work. It's not a panacea, but it would help. What was the second part? Uh, would it stop deni distributed denial of service attacks? Nope. Firewalls will not stop a DDoS attack. Remember, the whole goal of a DDoS attack is to uh, swamp the system. And uh, 
no router could do that. You, you could make some adjustments, you know, like quality of service adjustments or something like that. But a aggressive, even halfway aggressive DDoS would swamp it. Yeah, stopping distributed denial of service attacks is still a big challenge. Uh, Tolowit is on a roll as usual. It's that good Hawaiian weather. Samola Taiwo. Hello, Mike. I am riding the 501 on Saturday. Good luck to you, man. 601 launches in November. Is my tutorial still valid? Yes! Samola, look, man, just because a new exam comes along, the old exam's going to be valid until, like, next July, I think. You always want to take the old exam. Nobody cares which exam you took. You'll never be in an interview that go, well, did you take the 501 or the 601? Nobody cares. Uh, if they care anything, they're usually going to care when did you take the exam. Because if it was 15 years ago, that could negate it a little bit. But nobody cares which exam you take. When a new exam comes out, nobody knows what's on it. I, I get the same objectives you guys do. I just get them earlier. Um, and so the worst training material on earth is the new training material that shows up for a new exam because it's completely speculative. That's not just for CompTIA. That's for any certification. Now, you give them a few months and people can tweak some things, you know, maybe make the test banks a little bit better, maybe change a few videos to get more in the direction of what CompTIA wants you to do, and then it's always going to be better. But, yeah, going for the new exam is always a mistake. So if you took, like, so there's going to be a six-month window where the 501 and the 601, you can take either one, right? So if you take it, uh, either the 501 or the 601, your reset, that three-year reset clock starts right there. Okay, so it doesn't matter what you've done. You've got three years from that time you took that exam and passed. So to answer your question, Samola, yes. The tutorial videos for Security Plus are still valid and will be so for many more months. Zerk 678, I do crypto mining as a hobby. Ooh, are you running ASICs or are you running a bunch of GPUs there in Zerk 6? Have you made any money? That'd be my other big question. Okay, we only have six more minutes and I really have to be very careful. So again, oh, I'll say it again in a minute. Uh, 245, Kevin Lopez. Is there a type of firewall that can detect when someone purposely de-offs you? No. Not that I'm aware of. So when you're saying de-auth, I'm assuming you mean that in like the 802.11, like an 802.11 wireless de-auth attack. So most of the time, wireless access points are on the inside of a network, so a router wouldn't do it. What you might want to be talking about in this type of situation would be uh, some type of network-based intrusion protection, or at the very least, intrusion detection system. So an NIPS or an NIDS. Uh, and there have got to be tools out there, because you can detect DOS under 802.11. And maybe if there were too many. Most of the DOS attacks I know require a lot of turning offs. And that, that could be one way to do it. Right answer is, is I don't know. Alice Potsy, why do we choose UDP over TCP when using a VPN? TCP meltdown. No, nope, I'm unfamiliar with the term TCP meltdown. Let me look it up. What is TCP meltdown?
Oh, okay. That's an interesting question. Uh, I, I don't know if I can answer all of it for you, Alice, but let me, a, let me ask what I can. Why do we choose UDP over TCP when using a VPN? We don't. Uh, you're usually going to pick a particular type of, in fact, most of the time we just pick a product. I'm going to use the Cisco VPN or, you know, I'm going to use the VPN that comes with my Linksys router or whatever it is. So you're usually just picking an application and then that application decides, you know, what type of actual software it, it's going to be running, uh, what type of port it's using, uh, and certainly whether it's using TCP versus UDP. Uh, so I'm not aware of that being an issue with VPNs. What happens if some data fails to be transmitted? Uh, in general, as a broad statement, uh, VPN endpoints have tool sets that monitor these things. And as the packages are pulled out of the tunnel and reassembled, you could use regular session and transport mechanisms to ask for more repeat the packets. The v, just because it's in a VPN wouldn't change that. Uh, yeah. So I'm actually sitting here trying to think to myself, what VPNs use UDP? I'm sure there are, but I can't think of any quickly. Can you explain TCP meltdown? No, I really can't. Uh, uh, Alex, it was a new term for me. Thank you for giving me a new term. Uh, but please don't tell me this is an objective on Network Plus. I'll cry. I will take a look at TCP Meltdown and get back to you. Okay. All right, back to it. I'm only up to, oh God, folks, it is 2.59. I am very, very sorry. We had, I was gonna do some more emails and I didn't get to it. So guys, here's what's gonna happen here. I'm going to shut down my stream here very shortly in about 38 seconds. So what will happen is I'll say bye-bye and I'll close. Don't go anywhere. Don't change nothing. Just wait there for a second and hopefully within a few seconds, we will, I'll be gone and the guys are going to appear and they'll be able to pick up on the question. Scott, you can see I've got up to about 248 and uh, so I'm assuming you're going to be there to help them. I have to go and I got to give a big commencement speech. So I'm about to say goodbye and I will talk to you guys and very soon. But as Mike say, bye -bye. Feeding the world holds its collective breath. And we're live. Hey, hey I love it. <laughs> Let's hope that transition went for as smoothly for everybody that's watching as it did for us. Right. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the first hour of the AMA. That was awesome. Uh, I'm Scott Jernigan, Editor-in-Chief for Total Seminars and uh, a frequent uh, collaborator and uh, partner with Mike Myers on many of his books and training materials and so on. With me today is... Dave, Dave Rush, Rush, company uh, senior instructor and Pi guy and senior janitor, whatever it takes. I, I, after Michael Smyer, I my top title is yes sir <laughs> or yes ma'am. Right. All right. I'm going to switch. I need to switch my uh, streams around a little bit. Go ahead. I'll start the live oh. chat. Yeah, I'll take a look at the thing. Uh, I think Alice, uh, Mike did a really great job answering that question. Um, the reason in general that we use UDP over a, uh, a VPN is because the applications that you're going to use over the VPN have either native TCP if they need reliability or UDP if they don't need it. So it just doesn't matter. All right, trying to catch up okay, on a couple so of questions. You're backing <laughs> up already, huh? You're all the way down at the yes. end. Yes. So those of you who are uh, hang out at our, our regular Friday Pi Day or drama, the Dave Rush Ask Me Anything, um, you'll know that uh, I have two streams running on the monitor right above me. 
that's kind of the where we're looking at the questions as we follow through. But then I have the live chat running to the right of me so I can like, you know, clear up spammers and that sort of stuff, right? So do the moderator duties while Dave talks. Uh, yeah, so uh, not occasionally, often you guys will post something hilarious and then, you know, I'll start cracking up while Dave is pontificating about something and he'll just look at me like, really? Really, Scott? <laughs> so this was the- Same thing, forgive me, I'm, I'm cracking up because there's some good stuff in here. I, I love web dev. Wait a minute, it's Friday? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's that's when I started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, web dev. Yep. All right, so doing All the right, same excellent. thing like this, reading questions, stand by and we'll find something good. So yeah, Paul, I was definitely the uh, the social engineering zone guy. Dave was the bad guy for that. I was. You know, we had a, a ton much, of fun doing that video. And a much bigger great. gut then than I did now than I do now. <laughs> we had we had uh, uh, Michael up on a rickety wooden table uh, with cameras angled down. The whole thing is kind of shaking just slightly as he's trying to like not to break the table just to get the shot angles. It, silly, silly, but fun. So yeah, are, are we on my, my, uh, my YouTube is vanishified. Really? Uh, Hold on. Okay. Now it's back. I just had to recycle yeah. the page. It was weird. Yep. That's what happens when you get creative with the technology. Sometimes anybody who really cares about this, ask us how we pulled this off. Uh, we're using what we call a brute force method, but it worked. Right. So Mike left off in questions uh, at around 248. So figured I could, uh, we could pick up from there. There's a, the big AMD versus NVIDIA discussion going on. Yeah. Uh, I'm a pretty hardcore NVIDIA fan and have lots of faith in their technology and, and their commitment to increasing their technology. And uh, yes, when new cards come out, they're, they've got the best game in town. So of course they charge a lot. And uh, those of us who can jump in at the beginning, uh, get to help drive the prices down for everybody else. And then eventually we can all play and that's, that's cool. So NVIDIA for sure. Um, at, at 2.48, Jeffrey Callow asked a really simple question. <laughs> Can you simplify TCP IP, please? So yeah. we got an hour just under. <laughs> we could do a, an hour for the simplification. Uh, let me try a really simple one, Jeffrey. Uh, in the beginning, there was IP. It was an addressing and routing system. And then they started building programs for it. They started out with messaging programs and things like that. And there weren't very many participants. And so if you did do something that got lost or didn't happen, then some human would just say, oh, I'll manually resend this message to my friend again. But as the, the whole system kind of grew and we added applications and the, the wires that they were using, basically AT&T long distance wires, weren't particularly reliable. They said, we're gonna to have to build some kind of methodology to say an application can figure out when something goes wrong. I was expecting a message. I was expecting a fragment of a message and I didn't get it. So they had to build in uh, timeout mechanisms and retransmit mechanisms and things like that. And when they formalized that process, they called it TCP, Transmission Control Protocol and it ran over top of IP, the addressing and routing protocol. And there you go, TCP IP in a nutshell about that big. Ask us again when we got a half a day to teach it and we could teach it in about a half a day. True. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more to that game, but that's, can we simplify it? Yeah, that's about as simple as it gets. GTX 1650 Super. Okay, you were one. Of, you were the guy who bought that. <laughs> hey, you know, it'll 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 play World of Warcraft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of folks talking about buying cards to use them for mining and pay for themselves. Well, and the Xerxes, uh, that's 
you know, if you can, if you can afford to get the expensive card and, and run it and do some data mining. And uh, as he said, he, he bought his latest card with the cryptocurrency yeah. that he had earned from the previous card. So, yeah. I mean, that's cool. That's perpetuating. That's cool. All, all you're paying for at that point is electricity, right? So as long as somebody else is paying for the electricity, then it's free money. I was doing some chatting with uh, that enigma, that engine, that engineered. I see how that's going. Okay. Or engineered. Even better. Makes more yeah. sense. Uh, about uh, Renfest. And I guess he wasn't aware that Renfest, of course, a couple of weeks ago, if you're not familiar with everybody uh, in most major cities, got a nearby Renaissance Festival and ours runs in the the late fall. And uh, when it opened up a couple of days after it opened, there was a pretty good sized fire that started at one of the food kiosks and spread to a couple neighboring ones. And then I think three nights ago, uh, maybe less than that, uh, they have a, a campground and there was a, an, an altercation down there and someone lost their life, unfortunately. So if engineer thinks I'm going down there, not happening. Well, I just don't go to the camp after dark, man. Well, there's always that, but I don't want to go to the restaurant where I burn down. I love Renfest. And yeah, it, Mike, uh, and and that engineered, uh, he said, I got it right, by the way. Um, Mike and uh, Wissa went two weeks ago. Oh, did that? I hadn't heard. Okay. Yeah, so they uh, dressed up and got to do some socially distanced turkey leg eating, I, I, you know, <laughs> and, and consumption, one would mm -hmm. assume. So... Fun stuff. Yeah, I think the way they do that now is they make the turkeys stay six feet apart when they're in the, you know, the, the what's the word there? <laughs> Come on, man. You got to sell the joke. In, <laughs> in the coops. There we go. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. So Telewis has asked this one twice at 252. What's the name of software you can use to create a PC? that acts as IDS, IPS appliance. Um, other than the one on the Pi, I'm not aware of it. I'm sure you know a, a Google search will come up with it pretty darn quick. But if you're talking about making it an appliance, that typically implies that it becomes a box that serves everybody in the network. It's not a host-based IDS, IPS. Uh, an appliance tends to be a network IPS IDS, a NIPS or a NIDS. And so while surely it's out there, I don't know what it is. Andre, you actually buy new components sometimes? Don't do it, man. Get a job. Then He's you can buy components. Dumping. It's 252. Yeah, Andre, Andre confessed he's dumpster diving, so. Yeah, oh, well, I knew you did it all. So I saw your notice about the third alternative <laughs> to success. So at 2.54, uh, Matt H. asked, hey, Mike, how does a PAE processor work? And I was like, hmm, what's a PAE processor? Turns out it's a memory management feature that Intel introduced way back in the Pentium. So so what's it stand for? Did, did you get that far? Because uh, by I the know. name, we can probably fake an answer or say, I don't know, I've forgotten. It's Physical too address extension. OK. So it's, it's literally just a memory, a memory management feature within a, a processor. But all Intel CPUs and AMD CPUs do all that stuff. So explaining how that works. Yeah, I'd have to go dig back into processors. Yeah, it, it, it's a little too deep for me at this point. Nope. My, uh, my passion in computing, aside from games, is in, in building them and fixing them and doing creative things with them, uh, going deep into the processor architecture and that sort of thing. We leave that up to uh, Michael Smyer. <laughs> he's the one who gets all into that and if you're, if you're really wanting to get into that kind of detail of stuff i highly recommend 
the forums at Ars Technica. This is a bunch of sites started with, with a bunch of grad students from MIT, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, and they have been hardcore deep in CPU architecture and computer architecture uh, for more than a decade. So Ars Technica, I'll, I'll even type in the URL for you because it's kind of weird sounding. Yeah, I would call it ARS. Uh, at 257, Taranchata, how does a streaming service, how does streaming services detect that a user is behind a VPN? So mm -hmm. I think, first of all, we got to distinguish if we're talking about a VPN here or a reverse VPN. Right. Uh, so it, it, I cannot see how it could, should, or would be able to detect that it's behind a true VPN. And I'm going to presume that you're talking about a reverse VPN, uh, VPN like the, uh, the Nord VPNs, the one where uh, you connect to uh, some server out in the cloud, or it actually through a, a, a box in the cloud that lives to hide your existence, namely your IP address from the destination that you're actually trying to communicate with. Right. So um, how does a streaming service detect that a user is behind a firewall, it couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't be able to do that. The whole point of a firewall is you contact it and your gateway router says, hey, I am 96.96.96.96. .96 I want to talk to uh, a BBC server, which I can't access normally out of the US. And he says, don't worry, I've got you covered. And because BBC says, I recognize that 96.xx is a US assigned IP address and we geofence that. We don't allow that. So we connect to a VPN server that's not geofenced, one at 100.100.100.100, just for the sake of easy numbers. And he says, hey, don't worry, 96. Dot, I got you covered. And he calls the BBC and gets the stream and it comes through him. And then he kind of, sort of like a NAT translation, translates the stream through him and it comes back to you at 9696. And it, it, the point of that kind of a VPN is to hide your existence from the end server, the end host, whatever you're communicating with. So if you're aware of some streaming services that can detect you're behind a VPN, my guess, oh, it's not a guess, I do know this. Uh, it's because they have created lists of the IP addresses of common reverse VPNs. And they say, oh no, that's a, that's an RVPN. We're not talking. Right. So and buying that. Alice popped the question. Um, oh my God. Congratulations. <laughs> in the stream. Oh. Uh, <laughs> asking, asking for a description of now that we you've done reverse VPN, contrast that with VPN. Okay. So a VPN is a really cool thing. It says, I've got a network. Maybe I even have just a host. Doesn't matter. And I want to connect to it with a computer that is remote. And I want to connect to it in just the same way that I would connect to it as if I were sitting in that network and took a cable and hooked it into the RJ45 of my computer and then hooked it into one of the switch ports of the switches in my local network. So a VPN says, I'm going to virtualize that process. I'm going to make it appear wherever I am. Mike's favorite example is the airport in Denver. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go with the airport in Antwerp. And I want to run a virtual cable from the computer that I'm using there in Antwerp uh, to my home network. Well, we can't do that, of course. Now I could simply call my home network uh, if I had some kind of remote service running on it, but that's not secure. That's the point of virtual private network is to make it secure. So what we do is we create a piece of software. We install a piece of software at the home network. This could be an office or whatever that has an encryption technology in it. And then we install the client side of that on your remote computer. And those two are gonna get in contact with each other. And they're first of all going to establish an encryption that's unique just to those two. So if there's anybody in the middle, they're not gonna be able to uh, 
intercept your communications. And then the next part, which is really super cool, is the VPN client software is going to give your computer an IP address. It's going to create an, a virtual network interface card and give it an IP address that conforms to the IP address on the VPN network that you're connecting to. So now for all intents and purposes, it's as private as having it on a physical cable, but we achieve that by uh, encryption and you are a native connected host on that network. So this doesn't get you into your computer uh, at your home network. You're not gonna take over the screen and keyboard. You're just connecting to that home network with this handy dandy laptop that you happen to have with you instead of the desktop that you carry around. Does that kind of make sense? Makes great sense to me, Dave. I love it. <laughs> you may have had some background in this. Maybe just a little bit. So Alice has been, uh, I, I recall her mentioning in the past that uh, she had a VPN, has a VPN set up on a Pi. And as I was going through future Pi episodes that we might do. Uh, I ran across some kind of documentation today that uh, somebody wrote up a, a, a document on how to install WireGuard, which is a VPN on an Ubuntu 20, uh, one of the 2010 systems. And I thought, oh, heck, WireGuard's available for Pi. So I put that in my list of upcoming things we can do. So be ready. We're going to have some fun with that. A couple of weeks from now, we got a couple other things on the menu between now and then. Yeah, when you said you were you were looking at future uh, Pi episodes, I was like, time traveling? What's happening here? <laughs> so Andre uh, had a question uh, specifically on on the, the VPN topic. Thank you, um, timer. This is 318. So okay. Ooh, you're way ahead. Right at the end here. Uh, will a VPN to your own private network work if the WAN side of your router uses a dynamic IP address? Yeah, but you're going to have to know what it is. Right. And <laughs> and if it changes, then it stops working. So right. you just have to you have to keep up with and most of the time when when ISPs uh, hand out a dynamic IP address for your internet connection, it doesn't change. Right? It just stays the same. Right. My change is about twice a year and the only once you find out what that change is, it's not usually particularly difficult then you just change it on the client side, right. on your VPN client. So back to 258, um, that engineer says, Mike's A plus videos are a thousand percent better than those other guys. So and uh, before Mike bailed out, I, I post, he was, he was just getting ready to leave and I posted that in our private communication. So he got that praise. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, and, and you're exactly you're right. And the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate the, uh, the, the kind words and, uh, and we, we, we put a lot of time and energy and effort into teaching, into helping people into, well, at least I do preparation. Mike just wings it, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we are invested in you very heavily. So this is, this is both our passion as well as our profession. So, yeah. Yeah. This is fun. When we heard Scott had to bail, you know, everybody was all at Twitter. What are we going to do? Are we going to just let it go we short or million. no, I mean, Scott and I both raised hands and said, we want to keep it going. Right. This stuff. Right. And Mike's like, are you sure? Cause you know, <laughs> it's, this is hard. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we got this, man. We got this. Pulled it off like a dream. Yep. 302 from The True Doctor. He's talking out with Dr. Quinn. Are you an MD or PhD? Why do they use the word SSH so many times? SSH login, SSH in HTML, uh, SSH packet in Wireshark. Why do we use it all the time? Because we use it all the time. Uh, remember, SSH is secure shell. Uh, its first use was to take the unsecure terminal telnet uh, emulation. Let's combine all the terms at once. <laughs> telnet or terminal emulation program, which wasn't secure and build some security methodology for it. That's twice I've used the word methodology today. Smack me if I do it again. I will. But it was, <laughs> it, it dawned on 
smart people out there, hey, wait a minute, if we can secure uh, just the movement of characters over a wire, we could use this to secure anything that moves data over a wire. And so we can now do HTML over SSH and FTP over SSH and it, it's, a, it's an encryption tool. So it's good stuff. You yeah. Be um, uh, Robert Kennedy uh, asked a, a, a specific question about the VPNs. Um, we use Open VPN okay. uh, at Total Seminars. It's rock solid, um, works great. So, and you can't you can't argue about the price. But yeah, open open VPN. Right, just it's like, open source, just like WireGuard. Um, yep. There was some news about VPNs it, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. Uh, and this one kind of hit me pretty hard because I was doing support on one of our Udemy platforms and a person wrote a question and said, how secure are VPNs? And I went and looked up to, to see if I could find reports of man in the middle attacks or any other kinds of failures like that. And I couldn't find anything. And that was my general response. We use a VPN at the office. It's open VPN. We're happy, healthy, and confident with it. Um, I was unable to find any reports of uh, attacks or vulnerabilities. And then three weeks ago, there was this report about a massive vulnerability that affects most VPNs, something along the lines of a master password because of the, the way they generate the uh, private key or something to that effect. So, you mean they finally discovered two, one, two, three? That's right. <laughs> Oh, and so 303, Alice, you actually were, were uh, uh, popping Benzilla 129's question, who was asking about the, the two different VPN types. So I hope we answered that question well enough for you. And thank you, Alice, for the uh, uh, little the boost post. Yes, please. Uh, OK, so let's, let's bash everybody's unfavorite or favorite manufacturer. We can do AMD and NVIDIA and Intel and whatever. I don't no, care. not Intel. Not Intel. Uh, somebody don't on our Intel forum. Unless you have no other option. <laughs> I, you know, you, you and Mike are into Ryzen these days. I'm still dyed in the wool well, Intel. Intel processors, yes. Yeah. Intel video, GPUs. And they just had some news. They've decided to, to re-enter with some high-end video again and, and get competitive. I just saw that a couple of weeks ago. So. NVIDIA is just going to clean their clock again. They can't. They're, they're too busy dealing with the ARM purchase. <laughs> Could be. Hunter Wellman, I'm trying at 306. I'm trying to learn more about using Linux. I have two VMs, Ubuntu and Mint, using Parallels and a Pi with Raspbian. Do you know of a good book or online learning resource for learning... Linux OS. Um, I can't think of a good book online. Uh, there you go. Oh, I know where you're going. Of course. So if you're going to prep for uh, Linux Plus, which is a, a two test exam these days, uh, there are uh, there's a tremendous number of Linux Plus books out there. And we're particularly fond of the one from McGraw-Hill. Uh, Mike's got his fingers in that pie. Uh, there, as far as online courses go, I can't recommend the stuff on Udemy highly enough. There's probably 190 courses on there. Right. So, you know, go and, and do your search and do your research and check out the previews. Uh, one of the people on here signed up for a, not a Linux course, but a, a course on Udemy there and didn't do the previews and, and found themselves pretty disappointed in the results. But well, yeah, but she signed up for a programming course that like, didn't have examples or something horrifying like that. Like what? <laughs> you can't do you can't do programming without projects and things. Yeah, that, you know, sock yeah. puppets and interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reading questions. Yep, we're reading questions. The Xerxes been mining off and on since 2014. Wow. That is dedication to the, the dream, man. You may have been the one who invented Bitcoin. They're looking for you. 
<laughs> thank you, Tullywood, for the whole lot of love. I think, oh, thank you. Okay. Guess what Dave's got hanging on the wall. Since it's not my show, I didn't put up a t-shirt. I just picked up a poster that I, I bought as a gift for a friend that I haven't sent yet. <laughs> Hey, there we go. Andre has pointed out, try Udemy.com. They've got a course, more than a course on Linux. I knew about the fires, not the shooting. Yeah, check the news. And at 308. Uh, not surprising that they keep that stuff kind of quiet. Yeah. But not me. I'll just throw it out. Oh, God, tell the waiter. We can do them all. We're going to do them all. <laughs> he can't help himself. Paul Skinner says at 309 saw an interesting use for GPUs during a CyberSec lecture when they used faster processing power uh, to architecture high end. Yeah, uh, so that's there's nothing new about that, Paul. That people have been cracking passwords with GPUs for a very, very long time. Uh, they are dedicated, they are math intensive, they're not general processors like CPUs. And so they, uh, they program the CUDA cores and all the other kinds of neat cores and turn those into super, or excuse me, high speed crackers. And the other, the other major use for GPUs, of course, it's also in video processing, not as in like gaming, but as in actually doing high end video production. Right. Um, that's well, yeah, you, there and uh, in medical imaging. Yeah. I mean, GPUs are amazing. They're amazing. Okay. And Xerxes K has responded in the same way. Every cryptocurrency used in encryption for their network or blockchain. Yeah, we've got a blockchain course uh, on Udemy that uh, one of our uh, subject matter experts did on our be behalf. Uh, it's, it's for coding, writing your own blockchain decoders. and. I think that's Tom Carpenter. Yeah, uh, no, that one is Michael. Michael ah, Solomon. Dr. Michael Solomon. Yes. Really, really amazing, amazing guy. Mm. So, yeah, check out if you can get the blockchain course. Um, wait for the sale. Yeah, the sale just ended Monday, but there's always another one coming up. Yep. I bought my Python class this week for after tax and everything, 12 bucks. So I'm stoked. Nice. Very nice. 311 Web Dev Bootcamp. When I open some sites, the browser says not secure. Should I be worried? Is it on my end or the site? Okay, so it's on the site. They aren't providing uh, a certificate for you. So you have to make that decision for yourself. If you're not going to pass information to them that's personal, uh, passwords, account numbers, account names, things like that, probably not a big deal. And likewise, if you're not passing anything to it at all, it's just uh, you're just browsing it and reading information and seeing images and things like that. That's generally okay too. However, if it's a site that you go to all the time and you never see that message before and, hey, wait a minute, this site might not be secure, you might want to hang a day or two if you don't have to go there. It's probably nothing bad. It's probably their certificate has been has expired and they haven't gotten around to installing a new certificate or uh, some corruption that they're going to get around to fixing. But you know, right. Here we go. Alice Potsy, certificates. You boiled that all down for me in a single word. Thanks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. Uh, at 3 11 p.m., Tarun Chadha asks How do containers manage to compress the operating system into such a small size? So, containers don't compress the operating system into a small size, containers don't hold operating systems. Containers hold applications and support files, and they use the native operating system that's installed on your computer. So what's in a container can be very small. The whole point of a container is so that you can have this compact little holder that holds everything you need to run an application, except that application. So you can move that container, copy that container, from computer to computer to computer, uh, the interface between the container and the local operating system is handled by the container manager. It might be the Docker program or something like that. But the cool thing about having all this stuff in containers is that you don't have to 
do all the installation and configuration and adding dependencies and things like that when you want to run a, run a containerized application on some system. All you got to do is install Docker or some other container manager and then inst copy over the container. That's what I got. Sounds good. I don't know enough about containers. I understand their, their concept and philosophy. I want to do a, a container on Pi, do Docker on Pi. And every time I start getting into it, my head explodes. <laughs> you just have to ask Michael. He'll you know, you. he knows oh, it. And, and the same, I have the same problem. Michael knows it very well. And when he talks to me about it, my head explodes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Kevin, um, at 3.14, uh, why do some VPNs get blocked? Yes, because the, the VPN servers are blacklisted. Right. As Dave mentioned. Uh, at 319, Kevin asks, should I worry about using tight VNC for my Kali Pi since it's not an encrypted connection, since I'm using it all within my land? I should not be worried, right? Absolutely not. If it's within the LAN, um, I was a tight VNC user 100% uh, before uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation started including real VNC with Raspberry Pi OS and Raspbian. Um, I wasn't even particularly concerned about it when I was accessing it remotely and doing it uh, with port forwarding on my router on the basis that I don't look at myself and what I do as a tempting target. Um, so for somebody to want to go through the trouble to hack me over even an unencrypted channel, there's a risk that's inherent. So, you, you know, you got to look at your own vulnerabilities and, and likelihoods. But that's one of the things that we, we talk about in Security Plus is, is risk analysis. How tempting of a target are you is one of those factors in the analysis. Right. But yeah, if it's on your local land, sorry, crunching ice. Who's going to bother you except uh, your kids or, or your spouse? Andre, 318. I think we found a topic that we had to get into because we're getting a lot of, of traffic on this. Uh, let's see. Will a VPN to your own Kevin private Kevin. network work if the WAN side... Of, oh, yeah, we covered that. Yeah, I asked that in real time. Yeah, we got to hit it. Okay. So, but at 322... Yeah. Andre has another comment. All right. This time, it's it's great Mike wings it. Then you can see that no matter how good you are, how much experience you have, sometimes things do not work as you want them to. Yeah. This is true. This is true. Um, and on, <laughs> on a live show like this, when somebody asks a question or somebody says, oh, you know, can you do this? Most of the time, Mike or Dave or me, I'm like, sure, I can do it, right? And you just go for it. But the, the danger of doing that, of course, is, is that things blow up and then you're like, what did I do wrong? You know, and, and but then people are staring at you while you're going, ah, ah, the pressure, the pressure. Um, so in, about, when, I'm sorry, good. So when we, when we teach classes in contrast, <laughs> <laughs> The, what what I, as I go through and, and Dave as well, um, we test everything, right? We take machines with us. We run through the labs before we do them, right? And then when we get into class and if we want things to blow up, that's scripted too, right? So we just have it all set up so that when things go wrong or so that we know that people are gonna do various mistakes because we did them in the setup, then when it happens live in class and people are like, Professor Scott, this doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, let's go through the steps. Yep. And then, it's, then it becomes the great troubleshooting exercise of just working through each step in the process and each interconnection of all the different pieces to figure out where the issue, uh, what happened that made it not work. And so it ends up being great teaching moments and uh, fun, really, especially if, especially if 
we've done our homework right and we know what the problem really is, right? And then it's just a matter of leading people through the process. So anyway. Right, Scott and I are, are both insanely fastidious about that kind of pre-testing. I've got all my labs done for the Friday Pie two days ago and then I, I continue to write and edit my notes for the next four days. But I'm, I'm ready for, as far as I know, every pitfall, except for the one big mistake I did the one time when I connected to the wrong computer. And <laughs> wow, that was that was live. That was live TV, man. <laughs> 324, Tarun, thank you for the nice compliment. And moving on, 324, the Xerxes thinks VPNs are generally safe. But yeah, we recognize that everything we think is safe, somebody's probably watching. Welcome back, Elbo. Hope you had a good lunch. Right. <laughs> Benzilla, I love that name. My kid's name is Ben. I may re-nickname him that. Benzilla. <laughs> <laughs> and since he's a lifelong, like, high high powered performance swimmer, yeah. he was pretty accurate when Would've you look. Would have been good in the day, yeah. <laughs> he hasn't swum since he got in college. Engineering works you hard. <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Let's see, 327, web dev. If passwords are hashed and salted, how do they get hacked? For hashing algorithm, something else? Um, it's harder to hack something that's been hashed and salted, of course. And there are two ways that they get hacked. One is you can completely bypass that whole process by doing rainbow table searches. So somebody exposes a list of passwords, then uh, hackers can start going through and just looking for the hash element right. without bothering to look for the salt element. Otherwise, if you're gonna do it by brute force, you use powerful processors like good high powered GPUs and you start with the forward end of it. Here's a word I'm gonna try. And here's a salt that I'm going to try. And we always use the same standard hashing algorithms and look for a result that matches up somebody's table entry. If you don't find it, then sequence the salt and do it again and do it again and do it again. But that's the whole point of salting is we got to change the password and the salt. So that's more than double the effort. It's, it's many, many, many times uh, squaring the effort. Right. So it becomes more difficult, but it's still not impossible, especially if the original password is not good. Right. Yeah, that's that's probably your, your first real weak point. And you don't typically get to define the salt. Anything that's using salted hashes <clears throat> tends to provide its own salt function without user input. Oh, man. So, so 328 Daniel Creo asks, hey, where's Mike Myers? Uh, Mike is doing a commencement speech for uh, Perscolis, which is a very respected uh, technical institute in New York. Um, and he is he was invited to do the commencement speech. And he said, oh, of course, I'd be honored to do that. That'd be great. And they said, and it's at 3.30, or in this case, 4.30 Eastern time on Wednesday. And he was like, Oops. <laughs> so Mike was on for the first hour, which when we finish this stream, um, we'll post it live because we're not going to have anything blow up on us. So we're not going to delete it. Um, but we'll post it. We'll post it live and or post it in the Total Seminars channel archive. So you can go back and, and look at Mike and, and listen to the first hour of witticisms and uh, tech goodness that Mike gave. So, and then oh, Dave good. and I jumped on after. Uh, Mike had to leave at three, uh, central time, our time, and just to be able to hang out with you guys for the next the next hour. So that's your answer. Elbo asked at 328, how much RAM is in a 3090? So there's no right answer to that. That's one of the cool things about the design is vendors can put in or manufacturers can put in different amounts of RAM uh, and, and therefore be able to sell them at different price points. I think the stock is 12 or 16. Does that ring a bell with you, Mike? Uh, Scott? 
Somebody will key in. Okay, so here comes somebody. Xerxes says there's 24 in his. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? 24 gigs of RAM in your video card when you and I go back to the days of a meg of RAM in our <laughs> PCs. More. Give me more. Mm -hmm. I want the one with the more GBs. Kevin Lopez, will we see the day that the Pi will have its own GPU? Hey, you never know what's up. Dr. Upton sleeve. He says he's got some pretty cool tricks. Well, it has it has its own GPU, right? It's just part of the system on a chip. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a dedicated GPU like he's thinking. Oh, you know what? Okay. How about now? So if you use, I'll give you two methods here. One, okay. the hard way. You can desolder the USB controller chip. It uses a PCIe lane that comes from the CPU. And then people are making uh, little bridge chips. So you pop this little bridge chip on and then you have, you're, this isn't something most of the people here are gonna do. Uh, and if I attacked it, it would be a, a week with my head buried in the dark and then solder irons, but people are doing this, okay? So you can snag that PCIe lane and run it to a riser board and attach a GPU into there. And all you need is the driver and there are people working on the drivers and the, the Vulcan driver has now been merged with not Mesa, and the, but yes, it's working. Second of all, dump that as a concept and get an IO board for the compute module that supports the PCIe lane natively. And you can plug one in right there, ready to go in any other PCIe device. Again, you're gonna have to write drivers unless somebody's already got one out there. But yeah, it's there. We got PCIe, and so we can connect to a GPU. We, they. They. <laughs> That's a little past <laughs> my skill level. Sometimes. That's more than my pay grade, Mr. Electrical Engineer. <laughs> I'll let you do that kind of stuff. Mm. Reading questions. Yeah. Wow, man. I did That's the other thing, that if you're new to the whole uh youtube live streaming thing is the chat window just goes insane and we'll scroll uh so you know and then it's like oh well, where were we yep. back up i'm working on 332 to doctor do his start window what's start do us itself i'm not i'm guessing dos not do us what starts DOS itself? So, good. Well, back when there was a separation, I guess in the in the operating system between the command line version, the disk operating system, DOS, and then the Windows shell that sat on top of it, um, it was it was very clear what what was happening. The uh, basic commands um were written in the initial the the motherboard was designed and has a bios right kind of it's hard wired lizard brain that knows these are the sequences for booting up a computer and at the end of that sequence go look at this specific memory address on the mass mass storage to run whatever is there and it's built into the the programming of the computer itself so back in the day if dos was installed we would simply start the computer and the computer would automatically find the dos executable run that program and then the operating system would start and then we'd type win right win.exe and we would start we would run windows nowadays the whole windows process is 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 right there so that when the uh computer's lizard brain goes go to this place to start the operating system windows is hanging out there ready to go so it just okay. yeah exactly right magic <laughs> Magic. Uh, I'm going to go one question ahead and then I'm going to go back. Tullowit, Ramble on. Uh, uh, Alice, you're, you're having problem running Cali headless 
can't run VNC. 58 and 5900 are open. Okay. Uh, VNC is enabled. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So you you have a VNC server running on your Kali host. And my question for you is, which VNC server are you using? Tight or real or whatever? Uh, and then which client are you using? So Tight has its own client that's proprietary to it. You can't use uh, the Tight VNC client on real VNC server and vice versa. So while the ports are there, there's some differential in the way they communicate with one another. Uh, so that would be my first guess is make sure that the VNC server you're using is the same make model as the client that you're using. And next, I had something in mind that was... He's using tight. Okay. So you got to use the tight client for that. And tight is really weird because unlike real, when you establish a session, it becomes session number one. If somebody else uses a tight client from another machine or you use one from uh, a VM or whatever, uh, and you connect to it, it becomes session number two. The two don't interact with each other in the same way that if two people try to real VNC to one. Uh, I'd ran, I, I poked around with tight on Kali and I got it working. So, oh, the other thing is uh, make sure you check IP tables or whatever other firewall is running in there. Uh, understand that, or how is it that you have confirmed that port 5800 and 5900 are open. If you scan them, use Angry or Advanced IP Scanner and, and check that or, or uh, hand map, something like that. So I think it's going to be a simple disconnect. We're going to be able to find it. Reading questions, remote picket, 334. We've got about 11 more minutes and we're behind about 25. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, we are. Okay. There it goes. Okay. Hey, Kevin, ask the same question I did. Way to go, man. <laughs> Way to go, Paul. <laughs> the answer every text you not be afraid to give. I don't know, but I'll find yeah. out. That's right. That's very good. My scroll just jumped again. Okay. I'm working on 340. Would you use GPUs for hacking and not the processor, such as brute force? Uh, I have read about it. I couldn't speak to it to say, oh, here's how to do it. That sounds like a, a good, simple Google search. I know, I've, I've seen tutorials out there how to do it. Because uh, Dave, start... Dave and I, we wear white hats. We don't <laughs> actually do any of that hacking stuff. That would be those other people. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I live to groan at your puns, Tullowit. <laughs> is there a good VPN that has a GUI on Linux? Why would you want, need, or care for a GUI on a VPN? The, the VPN sits there and does its thing silently and quietly in the background. There's nothing to manage it after you've installed it. Um, is there a good one out there? I'm not aware of it. Uh, every one that I've ever installed... I'm thinking of an open VPN that uh, is built into Asus routers that is kind of GUI for setup, but once, no, it's not. It's, 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 it's all the usual kind of uh, router management menu oriented, fill in the box. And I, I suppose there's clicking, and it's, but it, it's not manageable after the fact. So I, I'm not aware of a Linux VPN that's GUI based. The one that I'm gonna do in near future is WireGuard. It's all configured by a menu. Uh, there's 17 questions that you have to answer in each menu. It's kind of like the way we did uh, the pie hole installation, if you got to see that a couple of weeks ago. And, and are you uh, gonna do WireGuard? Yeah, I haven't got the date set for it, but uh, I'm, I'm getting stoked. Okay, uh, right, I started cool. playing with it last night. Yeah. What, are we doing? what are we doing on Friday? On Friday, we're going to do the simplest lab that we have ever done. We're going to install a status LED on our Pi to tell us if it's powered up or powered down. Problem with the Pi is if it's plugged into power, 
there's an LED that's always on and you can't tell if the Pi is running or if it's not. So this is one command, one edit in an existing file and wire up the LED. Dead, dead simple. Will I present it that simply? No. <laughs> yes, I will. But then I'll do the longer version. Oh, I zoomed. We're uh, 342, I'm back. 342, yeah. That engineered, are we doing any local seminars or training? Um, you know, we're still, we're, we're, I mean, Houston, Houston and Harris County are still pretty uh, locked down. Um, our, our cases and COVID, right? It's the reality we're all in right now. Um, doing a live seminar enclosed where I'm literally right there with other people. It's just, it's just not happening. Yep. You know? God is so paranoid. He wears his mask around his dog. So <laughs> I was thinking about that though, talking about uh, talking true. to the company about, yeah, <laughs> might come through the speaker. It's true. <laughs> We're breathing the same electrons, Dave. Yep. -er. It's all the way there is not currently a Pi hat that's a GPU. Oh, um, and uh, that engineered, uh, do we, did we, before the whole coronavirus craziness lockdown, did we do local classes? And the answer is not really, kind of strangely. Um, yeah, call it kind of. Does Michael go do one for a school? Yeah, I mean, and local, I mean, I will, we'll go to Louisiana and teach classes there. It just depends on where the uh, training money is coming from, really. Um, we still do a lot of classes for um, various government agencies where the people sit there and play with their firearms while <laughs> studying tech. Um, and those will pick up again. Uh, for sure. They've already, they've already asked for classes. I'm like, I don't want to get on a plane, man. So anyway, but that's, hopefully that will come back because that's, we, we love it. I mean, we love, we love the teaching aspect of this whole thing. Tell with 348, uh, they still have socketed BIOS chips. There are some that are soldered, but there are still plenty that are pluggable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? Uh, Tallowood is one of those chips that you're saying that had a, a bug with many legs. You're right. They used to have BIOS chips that had uh, 20 and 30 and 32 legs. Uh, the current BIOS chips, this will knock you out, has eight, four on a side. Huh. Wow. Most of them. Okay, so Alice, you scanned it with Angry, so it responded with 5900 and, and 5800 which is the normal ports for v, uh, VPNing. Uh, hey, shoot me an email, uh, davear at totalsem.com. And uh, we'll do a little back and forth emailing or, or we can talk about it on Discord. Let's do that. Uh, maybe we can do some screen sharing, screen sharing there too. Yep. All right, I'm gonna put the Discord link up. Okay. And do you have the slide with our contact information? I don't. Well, okay I then. Do. I do, I know where it's at. So if you have questions, of course, you can always email Mike, right? Michael M at totalsim.com. And shockingly, mine, my last name is Jernigan. So <laughs> mine would be Scott J at totalsim.com. And Dave, whose last name is Rush, would be Dave R at totalsim.com. Are you seeing a pattern here? <laughs> here so yeah, go. feel free to email us um, or contact us. Uh, there is our contact information. You can see even our Steam accounts on there. I'm uh, currently playing, what am I playing on Steam? Civ 6 because I can't stop playing. Uh, <laughs> Skyrim though, you just got into the other day. Uh, Skyrim? In yeah. My, my son was like, why aren't you playing Skyrim? And I'm like, well, because I didn't play it. And so there's a, not, it's new to me. Uh, but an updated edition of Skyrim with all updated graphics and it looks really pretty and it's great storytelling and 
So yeah, I'm sucked right back in. Life is good. Davis oh, PC repair, 349. Yeah, we got about three minutes. I'm gonna do this question okay. and we can do any shutdowns. How does a quad core with eight threads work? And if you, well, uh, Mike just did a presentation on that, dang it, uh, on Monday. And then he has since deleted that Monday one. What a shame. Okay, so we'll try and do this really quick. Oh, we, yeah, we talked a little bit about this the other day too. You were talking about affinities, if I, if I remember you correctly. If you want to assign a program to say core zero and core three, can you do so without problems? Yes, you can. Um, why? I have, we talked about that in the chat the other day. I, I have no idea why you'd want to do this unless you're doing some kind of weird debugging or some weird you know, programming testing or something like that. But think threads, first of all. So threads is an artificial CPU that lives within a CPU cord. It's the four or five step fetch, decode, execute, and write model. And then there may or may not be some additional sub steps in there. So most manufacturers, Intel and, and uh, AMD, are building two threads for every core that they put on a CPU. There's probably some exceptions that I'm not aware of. And then a core is a real CPU. It's got everything that a, the old standalone single chip, single CPU had, except they managed to squeeze two of these on the same die, the same integrated circuit, and interconnect them so that they can share jobs. Um, with two minutes to go, there's no way that I can roll down this much further. That's going to be right. a full hour discussion, but that's the short version. Yeah. Soon enough, we'll be saying, I remember when we only had two terabyte drives. Right. You kids and your two terabyte drives. <laughs> <laughs> or more, more likely, you kids and your 64 right. terabyte drives. Right. You don't know how good you've got it. <laughs> right yeah so uh, you, that i can answer in one minute or less yeah i i put the discord link up um Good. dave and i will probably go hang out there for a little while uh it's more of a social thing but we can certainly answer other questions um and then we'll be here on friday for friday pie day um where Dave uses uh, the Raspberry Pi, which is an all-in-one, beautiful, inexpensive computer um, that runs Linux. And we use the Pi for teaching Linux aspects of A+, Network+, Plus, Security+, Plus, and such, so forth. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great, great platform to get in and, and play with, and it, it's fun in its own right. So, yeah. Oh, good morning. All right, we're on the hour, so we'll good. see you on Friday. And everybody have a good day off between now and then. We'll see you on Discord in a couple of minutes or anybody who wants to come over there. And if you haven't, you know, stick around this chat. We'll stay up for a couple more minutes. Get that link and come on over and join us. We get uh, new people every day. And when I say us, I mean, Jose, he set it up. He runs it and he's kind enough to let us join it and participate. Absolutely. So, so Discord until Friday. All right. Have a good day. Goodbye. And here's hoping that Michael is watching and has his clock set and Cuts us off. <laughs> Mike's episode.